Marshall Islands consists of 34 atolls, with more than 1,200 low-lying islands spread across the vast Pacific Ocean. People living in the outlying atolls rely on conventional water sources such as rainwater harvesting and wells. The islands are highly susceptible to extreme weather and climate change, including droughts, floods, storm surges, storms and typhoons. Risks that are anticipated to increase as a result of climate change and climate variability. The 2016 drought in Marshall Islands was one of the most severe in recorded history, similar to previous events in 2013, 1998 and 1983. It caused serious water shortages, agricultural losses and health impacts for an estimated 53,158 persons across the country. A one-month state of drought emergency was declared by the government of RMI, which was subsequently elevated to a state of disaster and extended twice. On April 27, 2016, the US President Barack Obama declared the drought a disaster for the Marshall Islands. People in the outer islands were impacted by the drought in many different ways. Well, I can talk about uh, 2013 as well because that was the most uh, worst one that we have. People were very impacted from that uh, drought. Not only that drought, but also the inundation, sea level rise. It affected, uh, affected also impacted the livelihood of the people in the island, especially the women. Lesson learned was not that we were not really impacted, not only from the food uh, side of it, but also as well as the water. You know, because there's, if there's no water, there's no food. You know, availability of water, we depend on the water lens and rain. We got the lagoon and the salt all over. So if there's a drought, you know, there's a huge impact in that area. The sparse and scattered nature of islands and atolls in the Marshall Islands makes communication and transportation between the islands very difficult. Well, um, the most uh, difficult one, one is the uh, transportation. Transportation here in the uh, Marshall Islands, we every three uh, quarters, three months, we send out uh, ships to the outer islands to you know transport food to the people and also bring in copra. The impact was clearly evident on those living on the outer islands. But when you see people who are having to walk long distances to access wells or community tanks, when the grass is, you know, the grass here is just brown and crispy and the coconuts are shrinking, it's just, it's really kind of heartbreaking to see. And it, it's, you know, I'm, I'm glad that a lot of people came together to do a lot in advance. And so it certainly puts a lot of stress, you know, for men and women differently. What are, what are your normal behaviors? What are you able to do to support your family? And how is that training, changing? when you're not able to harvest copra, when you're not able to pay for food, when you can't do your normal cooking and cleaning procedures. Um, and so that's, you know, we really did see hardships for people in the Outer Islands, and we're hoping that the assistance that collectively we, we were able to give was able to relieve some of that during, during that really intense dry period, which did last almost six months. This had widespread impact on the livelihood of everyone dependent on agriculture. What I've seen with my eyes is that um, it really impacted the, um, the agricultural side of things. Also the water, um, hygienic. And I, I saw that it um, affected the, uh, the copra collection production. Because that's one of the means of making um, money in the Outer Islands. It's by processing the copra and making sure that they collect as much as they can. But the drought itself really affected the, um, the live crops and the coconut trees. That way it affected the farmers. Having experienced two severe droughts in the past five years, Marshall Islanders have many experiences to share on how to build resilience in readiness for future droughts. These include empowering communities. 
I think from the last drought and also connecting it to the 2013 drought and then also looking at this 2017 short-term drought is really the biggest lesson I have see that's being learned is the need for continued monitoring and watching the weather forecasting but also empowering communities and providing them tools and training on how they can be agents of change to be prepared for times of drought. Constant communication ensured people took heed and responded to the early warning signs of droughts observed in the outer islands. This is where I say that the line of communication is really important because we started to notice the drought impact because um, the outer island people, they started to call here in the center, the Majuro, saying that they are experiencing, there hasn't been no rain over the last two to three weeks. And also um, their coconut production, it's not producing as much as they expected. Um, even the, um, our women in general, when they, do, they were doing handicrafts and all that, they started to see and they started to feel that the materials they, they are using for the handicrafts are starting to getting depleted or getting much lesser. In the Marshall Islands, each atoll has an elected mayor who is responsible for the welfare of the communities. Their constant updates ensure swift and coordinated approach to bring relief. Connection. I think that that's the most important thing is the connection between the national government and the local government and the grassroots. Then that's where the mayor comes in and kind of go back and forth as a liaison officer going back and forth between the three sectors. And, and of course, the, um, the programs and the, uh, NGOs that provide um, technical trainings and that, uh, that, that kind of stuff. And the mayor's network will remain critical to ensuring rapid response in any future national crisis in the Marshall Islands. They, they are the most active part that the contour that actually connected to the national and the local, well three and the, uh, of course the grassroots. So they, they, they are very important and that's, and again, that's where uh, I think the government should also take the initiative to uh, provide capacity building to these uh, mayors so they can be able to um, come up with ideas and formats of uh, future uh, plans to strategize their future. <laughs>